I've been using an HTTP API as a consumer, and this is how it was returning error messages. It's returning back a 200 OK, and in the body of the response, it has an error property that has a user-facing message. Hey, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com, and you might be thinking, if you just return a 400 status code, all problems are solved. Well, not really, because ultimately you want some structure of data and a good developer experience so the developers can handle those errors because oftentimes you need to service that to your end user. So that API I was using, this is how it returned errors, but this is how we returned success. Still a 200 status code. It's just the structure of the response body that's different. This has some message, some data, and then the error just had an error message. And that's how the distinction needed to be made. If there's an error property, it was an error. If there wasn't, it wasn't an error. Now the problem with this, and you probably think of many, but more specifically, it's just that the payload is dictating whether it's an error or not. So depending on the tooling that you're using and having to deserialize and have a property, is it nullable, is it not nullable, it can just get really gross depending on how you deserialize and the tooling that you're using. Before I get into how to make your error messages human readable and machine readable, I'd like to thank Current for sponsoring this video. Current's an event native data platform that feeds real time business critical data with historical context and fine grained streams from origination to destination, enhancing data analytics and AI outcomes. For more on Current, Check out the link in the description. So it's really just about being explicit about the success or failure of the request. I consumed a lot of APIs, likely older systems that do exactly this, where what they have on a failure is they always have a status property that just dictates success or failure. And they always have a property, for example, message that's kind of user facing. So here's a failure, for example, and it's still a 200 okay. And then on success, I still have the status in the message. This is exactly the same structure. These always two exist. And then I can determine by it, I always deserialize knowing those properties are gonna exist. And then on success, I have some, maybe some extra data as well as my message about what actually happened on, based on that operation. This is very typical. I see this in older systems. Now you still might be saying, sure, but if you just use the status code, this isn't a problem. And I agree with you, if you can, and I'm all for using status codes appropriately, but if I get a lot of comments from people on similar videos to this, they'll say, no, 200 okay, and just be explicit in the response. I'm actually totally fine with that answer because you're being explicit. And so as long as documentation states that's what's gonna be the case, I'm all for that. All I really care is about having an explicit indication on success and failure. A little bit of an example of this is QuickBooks Online and their HP API, where what they return is a fault. So it's always this structure of a particular, it shows the fault type. And more importantly here, the very specific error code that has occurred, which you can look in the documentation to see, as well as the message and the details. But they return this to you in a 200 okay. They return you a 400 if the actual request body itself is malformed or has syntax issues. So here's an example of things that I was talking about at the very beginning, which is the structure of the data, kind of the developer experience and kind of that human readable messages. So the error type, the fault type here is a validation fault. And I can be using that at runtime to understand maybe something else more specifically I want to do with the results of this error. I get a specific error code that is related to length, uh, length exceeded limit and specifically what it was. It was related to the first name. I have another error here with this exact error code that again, when I'm deserializing it, I might be deciding I want to do something with these specific error codes. Maybe I truncate, then automatically retry. Maybe I use these to form a better end user message to my user. But it's covering both of giving something programmatic that I can understand, as well as if I were just debugging and troubleshooting, I see exactly what the issues are. So it's a good developer experience that I can see specifically what the errors are, as well as more explicit error codes that I can use programmatically at runtime kind of down a path and I may want to choose to do something specific with it. Now you might also be yelling, can we just not use a standard here? Why does everybody have to create their own error responses? Can we just not come up with a standard? Well, you're probably using a framework that actually is using a standard, which is problem details. Problem details has been around for a long time. If you're using any modern web framework, it probably supports it. However, I still just don't see it enough used in public APIs, at least that I consume. Let me know if you've used one that is using it. But here's the RFC, I'll have a link for it in the description, but it really does cover everything that I'm talking about, about being explicit, being able to use information at runtime specifically, as well as giving you documentation, understanding kind of human readable format that you can also use while you're developing or passing through to your end user. So as an example, what the problem details response is, 
The type, this is a URI. This is kind of really the primary way that you're gonna understand what particular error occurred. You're gonna have a title, which is gonna be human readable. The status code, which is gonna match the actual HP status code. And then details, which are also human readable. So I'll take this as a little bit start, step further and kind of elaborate a little bit more. Is my type here could be related to a specific URI that if we were to navigate to it, would give us documentation about what that particular type uh, of error is, why it might occur, and some other details about what might actually be in this response. So the title, same thing, status, and the details. So if I take this a little bit further of the example, let's say we have a type that's invalid parameters. So that's what our URI he is here. That's our primary kind of error code, if you will, that we can distinguish what actually happened. And again, we can use this as our developer experience when we're developing to realize, okay, through the documentation, it's actually gonna state that we're actually gonna have a property that's gonna be in our, like a collection of key value pairs to tell us what in our payload that we sent is invalid. So we can use that potentially, again, at runtime, it's machine readable, we know based off our documentation, we can expect that when we deserialize. So we're doing this combination of, we have human readable, we have machine readable, things that we can use at runtime. That's very explicit about the error occurred and what we might want to do with it at runtime. As an API consumer, which you probably are yourself and producing APIs in the outputs, it's really about being explicit about success and failure. And when failures occur, Understanding there's that difference between what's machine readable and human readable and what you can use at runtime and at design time through that developer experience about being able to see documentation about specific errors that occurred, things that you can program in about when those occur, maybe what you want to do about it, but just being really explicit about it. Problem details is the solution to that. It has some issues with it uh, if you've used it. I just never really see it enough in the wild. It seems like everybody does implement their own, which I'm not really even entirely against per se, as long as your documentation is thorough, it explains exactly how your responses work, and especially with errors, I don't really care. I just want something that I can build that is very explicit about what those errors are and that I can manage it. Now, if you're using problem details, I'd love to know about it because I, again, I just don't see it enough in the wild. And if you come up with your own homegrown error responses that's custom to you, whether it's public or private, get in the comments and let me know, explain how you've done it between machine readable, human readable, and what you've done. And thanks to everybody that supports my channel and that's joined my channel. I really do appreciate it. The link's in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.